Next up, we have Rika Antonova. Um, do you want to? Are you able to share your screen? So I will be talking about analytic manifold learning with neural networks, and this is a subset of work that I'm hoping is interesting to the um, uh, deep math uh, audience. And the full write-up we have on archive. That's joint work with uh, Maxim Maidanski, who is also attending Deep Math, and Dan Sakrajic, who is my advisor uh, at KTH in Stockholm, and Sam Devlin and Katja Hoffman, who are uh, researchers at Microsoft Research Cambridge. So uh, you're probably quite familiar with uh, uh, one of the Kind of paradigms that we have in machine learning of how to describe a uh, latent manifold. And we frequently do it uh, by saying that there is a map from some high dimensional space, here is an example of pixels, to some low dimensional space with some desirable properties, maybe you know some uh, nearby relations. And then the submanifold is represented by an image of this map. Okay, so that's very comfortable. Now, if we have a slightly more advanced uh, case where we are interested in some source domain that maybe has a lot of uh, free uh, or cheap data, and then we have a target domain like real images, here is just simulation, but you can imagine like this is a real robot with, with real images, and this data is harder to get. And we want to start from this uh, map, uh, but we want to now uh, have the on the source domain, but we want to now look at, uh, can we encode something similar in terms of the latent space, but now on the target domain. So frequently- Rika, I think we cannot see your slides changing. Yes, now we can see. It. Excellent. So that was the map that I was talking about, uh, visualization of it, but you could probably imagine it in your head. So map from high dimensional space pixels to low dimensional space, you know, some interesting manifold that, that we have in mind. And we uh, think of this uh, submanifold as uh, an image of this map. All right, and this is what I was describing from source domain to the target domain. Uh, on the target domain, we want to learn something and we suspect that the latent manifold would look similar, but now our input space is different. So this is kind of the standard setting for um, transfer learning of sorts. So what would we do if we start with this map F? Um, the standard solution would be to fine tune it. And then we're well aware of some problems that might arise such as catastrophic forgetting. Uh, the other problem that might arise is that we would have um, kind of learned really uh, on this sort of data and we could be in the local optima that is good for this data and we could have trouble getting out of this local optima and having our uh, map F um, describe this target domain well. And another problem is that we would uh, also likely to have to set the learning rate to be pretty small in order to keep the structure of this latent space. So these are some kind of shortcomings of, of having this traditional uh, view of using the mapping view to describe the latent submanifold. So we uh, take a slightly different perspective and we say, how about we describe the submanifold by um, saying oh, what are all equations or relations that have to hold for the points on the submanifold. And then the submanifold is represented as a null space of a set of functions. So here, a very simple example, uh, just to make it concrete. So we, we have an ellipse here here, right? And this is an intersection of a hyperboloid and a plane. So our two relations are the hyperboloid and the plane and their uh, null space of these sets of functions, in this case g1 and g2, is the ellipse, all right? So this is uh, kind of the alternative view that we take. Now, um, this has been previously, uh, in a sense, like this, this relations view has been helpful for uh, helping to learn better latent spaces. In previous work, uh, in particular in, in robotics or in anything that involves a dynamical system, where something about the properties of the latent space is known from domain knowledge. Like, for example, we can postulate that the previous state of the dynamical system is not too far or somehow is continuous. Uh, and this relation of uh, it being not too far from the previous state uh, is something that we can put as uh, either constraint or an additional loss when learning the uh, when learning to encode the high dimensional uh, data into low dimensional data. And the problem with uh, kind of putting these things, these relations by hand and coming up with them by hand is that of course, for each new setting, for each new task or a system that you're describing, you would have to create a comprehensive set of these relations and it's not a priori clear how to do that. So what we propose in this work is we uh, propose to learn a set of these relations uh, automatically and learn them in such a way that they are non-linearly independent and we make sure to define the independence rigorously. So why do we want them to be non-linearly independent? Well, it's uh, kind of by analogy with, with the linear case where somehow uh, independence denotes that you're bringing some new information in the relation in, in the next relation that hasn't been encoded in the previous relations. So that's, that's the kind of high level intuition. So let's uh, look at the mathematical setup for this. So we start with the ambient space Rn of uh, 
the space of all possible uh, latent states, uh, latent uh, state sequences. So this tau I will denote by the uh, short for the latent um, state sequence, and this is composed of state uh, uh, action, next state, next action, and so on. So um, I come from robotics, so for me it's very easy to think uh, of this in terms of being some simulated, uh, uh, let's say, example where I know what is the state of the object and what is the action on the object and so on. And later on I will show kind of how this applies to when we want to do symptorial where I don't know the, the kind of these ground states anymore. Uh, but nonetheless, the structure of the latent space that I will be learning, like what, can, what are relations that, that, that are holding for these uh, states and actions in simulation, that would help me to structure the latent space better. All right, so this is the ambient space, but the ambient space is just, you know, all possible values for this just in, in some box, so it doesn't have any structure. And then the, this n here will denote the submanifold of the actual uh, state sequences that are a state and action maybe sequences that our dynamical system can generate. So if we have a simulator, let's think like from starting state and doing any sort of kind of actions, what are the possible sequences uh, that, that we could get here, right? So that, that are actually valid, that are physical. And our goal is to capture this whole, so the, what we call this whole thing, the, the data submanifold, the latent data submanifold, by learning the relations that have to hold for the points in the submanifold. In this particular case, the relations between all these uh, different state and actions in the subsequences. Okay, so in linear algebra, uh, dependency is a linear combination of vectors with constant coefficients. So we can start from that and say that in our nonlinear setting, we have an analogous notion that actually comes from abstract algebra, and that is called the syzygy. And directly uh, from that part of the math, the definition of this is that it is a collection of functions, uh, f1 through fk. Uh, it's called the syzygy, so I'll denote it by this uh, f here um, with a cross. And it's called the syzygy if uh, the sum of the functional coefficients multiplying the relations is zero. And if there is no such syzygy, so if we cannot find such syzygy, then we say that these relations G1 through GK are independent. So you can see an analogy with the linear case right away. And uh, you know, this is a definition that already exists in another part of math. So you know, we're very happy. But um, you can also quickly spot that this notion of independence would deem any two relations dependent. And that's because in a sense, it is a little bit too flexible. So our functional coefficients now, they're sort of of a very similar format or you know, the same format as these relations G. And so that's why we can uh, basically pick the uh, functional coefficients in such a way that for any G1 and G2, we can always make the sum zero. And so we would say that they're always dependent. So that means that this is not very uh, useful for us. And in this work, we define a few notions of um, independence, which is more useful. Like for example, uh, we define a restricted syzygy, which restricts that the last uh, functional coefficient is minus one. And then it's an analogous notion of restricted independence that says if we cannot find such a syzygy with the uh, last uh, functional coefficient bound to the value minus one, uh, then these um, G1 through GKs are independent. And uh, this we uh, are going to be using for learning independent relations iteratively. So uh, what we're going to be doing is finding G1 and then G2 that is independent in this nonlinear sense, in the restricted sense uh, from G1, G3 that is independent from G1 and G2 and so on. And uh, one of the results that we have is that uh, this uh, process uh, ultimately would terminate. So that's a good thing to have for an algorithm. Another result that we have in the paper is that if we have a, a strong independence here, so if we don't insist that this uh, f sub k is negative one, but if we uh, only insist that it is expressible as a combination of some functions multiplying the previous uh, g1 through gk minus one relation, then uh, with the strong independence, what we can uh, have is we uh, have a theorem which guarantees that when we add a new relation, then the dimension of our learned data manifold uh, is at most uh, n minus k after we add the kth relation. And this basically because we start with uh, high dimension meaning all the ambient space, uh, we cut down dimensions and now we can show that we cut, cut down dimensions each time that we're adding a new g sub k. So in a sense uh, here we could be hoping that we would eventually with a finite kind of terminating process describe the whole space. And here uh, if we're using strong independence then we can know that each relation contributes a certain thing in terms of how we cut down the dimensionality. So we also have an alternative definition of independence via transversality. And um, that uh, is inspired by uh, some notions in differen differential geometry and you know, could be beneficial for, for uh, some cases. And uh, in this case, what we have is that 
two relations are trans transverse if their uh, gradients with respect to the input are linearly independent. And with that, we also have this uh, result that the, um, the hypersurfaces um, that are defined um, by, by this are transverse along their uh, common intersection. And then this intersection is a submanifold of Rn of our mn space of dimension m minus k. So this is the same idea of being able to kind of get a hold on how we're cutting down on the dimension of the learned uh, manifold so far. And so uh, what we have with this is we have a mathematical setup where we have all the results that we needed. And since they um, it describe to us what would happen when we're using, um, when we learn analytic relations G1 through GK, these can be approximated by neural networks. And uh, what we will have now is an algorithm that would uh, come up with this, basically learn these relations automatically that are uh, independent in either this restricted sense or using this transversality definition that we have, uh, but now in an approximate uh, way with neural networks. So I will not, I will kind of highlight uh, these things here, but I want to leave kind of enough uh, time for questions. So through this, I will go fairly quickly because a part of this work is um, also working on non-stationary data where our sequences come from um, rollouts from reinforcement learning actors. So we're not um, learning from a data set, we're actually learning from um, non-stationary data. And so that makes it a little bit more challenging. But to this algorithm kind of to, to the kind of core point that I'm trying to illustrate here, it doesn't matter, it just means that it also works for that kind of data. So the way that it works is, okay, we first obtain the G1. And in this case, this G1 is expressed by the neural network. So uh, we obtain the G1 and we have the loss, which says that uh, on the, um, as you go away from the manifold, you should be, uh, your, um, uh, your gradients uh, should not be staying zero. So you should not be learning a trivial relation where you would take a neural network and just say that, okay, well, everything is zero here. So my own manifold data is zero. So this is how we ensure it being non-trivial. After we learn this relation G1, then we uh, train relation uh, G, uh, you know, G2, G3 and so on. And if we're using transversality, then we directly use the loss uh, that basically encodes the, um, you know, what we expressed in, in the mathematical formulation as transversality, just in a computationally kind of effective way. And um, then that's it. If we just want to uh, find the relations that are transverse and we're done. If we want to find the relations that are independent in this more flexible uh, way with these uh, restricted syzygies, then what we do is we feed off manifold data. So you can think of it as like slightly thickened data or uh, random uh, data. We feed off manifold data to all the relations. Uh, they come up with some uh, answers. So these relations learned so far. And then we try to find the syzygy, uh, meaning the relation between relations, uh, with this the restricted syzygy with this last coefficient uh, fixed to minus one. So this is exactly how we encode the math in this you know, algorith algorithmic way of learning this uh, everything approximated by neural networks. Okay, and then if we uh, if we find uh, the syzygy, then we freeze uh, all the uh, all the neural networks, uh, and then we will try except except for the one that we're currently learning, except for the one that is responsible for learning this uh, last relation that we're currently learning, and then we we'll try to push away uh, the last relation that we're learning from the current solution, meaning that we try to make it. Uh, not dependent anymore, um, make it such that we can no longer find the syzygy, meaning relation between relations for these. And we uh, proceed. So like, okay, we found two independent relations, then we move on to finding the third one and so on and so forth. So this is inspired a little bit like a high level inspiration for this is something um, called um, Frank Wolf algorithm, which uh, kind of incrementally, it's, it's kind of like maybe related to boosting if you have seen this AES before too. It incrementally finds uh, additional components, uh, additional solutions to the problem. And then as a combination kind of you, like you would have the result that describes your target uh, you know, uh, object that, that you wanted kind of. You can apply this to let's say mixtures of Gaussians or you can apply this to kind of uh, pieces that solve your problems and so on. And so here the high level view of this is similar in the sense that this is why we kind of want to learn it sequentially, the motivations would be similar, but we are basically implementing the math that we wrote down in this kind of neural network form. Okay, and uh, to summarize, uh, this is visually uh, what uh, kind of how do these relations look like? This is on a, a toy example here, just so that, that we can understand visually how the results look like. So learning with transversality, for example, again, this uh, noisy version of the data manifold that is represented uh, by this ellipse. 
relation G1 and G2, you can see they're transverse. One is the plane, the other is a hollow cylinder that is kind of almost at 90 degrees to this plane. And their intersection is this uh, desired uh, um, ellipse that is noisy here. And if we insist, so here with transversality, because we're in 3D, it's enough for us, the two relations. But if we insist on learning more, then we will get other shapes, like for example, these smoothed cones and combining them all together would still result like in a slightly thinner um, uh, noisy ellipse here. If we learn uh, with restricted syzygies, then you notice here, we have uh, much more sophisticated shapes here. Uh, but the benefit of having this, even though you end up learning a little bit more of them, right? The, the representation is not as uh, you know, concise, so to speak. Um, they don't differ from each other too much. So this could be useful in settings, for example, where maybe these things compose some sort of, um, describe some polysters or something that you don't want to change too much as you're adding new components um, or they, you don't want the components to differ too much from themselves. So that's kind of uh, an alternative uh, um, result that you can have with this, but ultimately you get this intersection describing your latent data manifold. And uh, we've applied this to um, other areas that have to do a little bit more with dynamical systems and robotics, uh, more specifically robotics. So um, here, for example, sliding block with uh, some aspects of the dynamics that are interesting like friction and drag and showed that what you can do is you can uh, train on a limited range and uh, this is just a visualization I can explain later if there are questions about this, but uh, you can train on a limited range of data and um, what you will find with uh, these latent relations is that you can still describe kind of the, the neighboring parts of this data as well. Uh, so that's nice uh, in these settings where we sort of have fairly regular uh, dynamics and we know that there is a lot of structure in it. And then the parts that you can see in the paper that I won't go too much into uh, detail here is uh, my, uh, I've done a lot of work with rational autoencoders. So here, what we have uh, shown is that you can uh, learn these relations on, let's say the simulator, and then you would, uh, in, you would impose these relations as you're learning on, so to speak, real data. So here I have simulated this kind of more advanced uh, visual uh, representation of the scene, but you can imagine this could be ultimately the real data. And so uh, what we would then do is uh, learn with a standard uh, variational autoencoder, but add to the loss of the variational autoencoder that its latent space should be following the, um, the relations that we have learned on the simulated domains. And then with that, what we can do is we can show that one, uh, we now can much faster get to the position uh, of the object that, that we're kind of trying to track uh, show up in, in our latent space uh, data. And uh, we also get a map, uh, an encoder map. So in the uh, VIEs, we have an encoder and decoder map. And we have an encoder map that maps from the high dimensional to the low dimensional space that has uh, better properties uh, in terms of um, this particular distortion metric. So that's where we uh, kind of wanted to take it. Ultimately, there are other uh, current and future work directions that we're looking into like lifelong learning with this uh, in the sense of like gradually evolving your policies and adding new components to that. Uh, and since real for robotics, like testing this on uh, real data as opposed to kind of advanced simulations. And so that's it now. I'm ready for questions. And both uh, me and Max are here. So uh, you can ask us uh, questions maybe if you see us in the breaks and so on. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Um, does any panelists have any questions? Well, then I have a, a quick question. So I, I like the plots that you were showing where you add, you know, as you add additional functions and you look at the intersections between them. Um, so I was wondering if you can combine this with something like, you know, minimum description length um, conditions so that you could try to find kind of the most parsimonious intersection. Um, Cause I think that would be meaningful in a lot of different applications. Is that amenable? So I think uh, this uh, kind of version with transversality, uh, this would constitute the concise uh, representation here. So in a sense, like here, you only need your relations, you are done. Uh, the interesting thing would be to know in a much higher dimensional uh, space, like when are you essentially done? Right. Yeah, so this yeah. would be interesting to know. Yeah, that, that would be an interesting condition. We haven't looked at, at this very much uh, because we're focusing kind of on a mathematical aspect of what can you prove about the settings of cutting down dimension and so on. But there is, uh, you know, a drop in dimension is not always in a sense of your data being described much better or, uh, you know, in the same way. Right. So in abstract sense, you, you always want to be uh, 
noting that as your dimension is dropping, you're doing better in terms of being concise, right? Uh, but it could be the case that not all dimensions are kind of created equal in your data, and then you have to think about something different. So then maybe you could play with this, and this would be interesting. For the syzygist, this would be particularly inter uh, interesting. This might be uh, a little bit challenging because and then you would have come up uh, with a criterion that describes for you conciseness in a way. Because here we're saying uh, nonlinearly independent, so it's like, yeah, we can show for you that it is contributing new data. How much new data? Well, that would be very cool like with i don't know if we uh, if we extend this to some sort of probabilistic framework we were thinking maybe some sort of mutual information or something like this right or basically some other maybe even some um, additional so to speak orthogonal metric that tells you how different your new relation is that is not coming from the same framework and then combining this would be interesting yeah thank you um, so we're uh, out of time for this talk, but uh, we'll go on. So thank you again for that talk. It was it was excellent.